That's older than most of us. I appreciate Brother Molly. It's been good to be here this week. It's been an exciting time for me. I've enjoyed it. Let me now again take this opportunity to try to express to you my gratitude for all you've done for us. For every gesture of kindness, for every kind word, you bragged on me so much, I got to where I think I can preach a little bit. Of course, I know better. It's him in me, not me. But I do thank you for uh, uh, the pastor for letting me come here and be in this great church. And you have got a great church. And you've got a great preacher. I thank God for your preacher. He and I have come close together this week. And I thank God for him and uh, for the work that's going on here. Be very, uh, just stay close to God. Stay close to God. And follow the man that God's got here to lead you. And that's what God's got him here. See, there's a chain of command. The chief shepherd, the under shepherd, amen, and the flock. That's it. Isn't that simple? Chief shepherd, under shepherd, flock. And that's just, that's not hard to remember. You can just always remember that. And when you take it in your mind and your ideas that you're going to lead on or you're going to do this or other, no, God's already got some leader. And anything with two heads is a freak. Amen. So thank God for you. And uh, I'll meet you on the other side. On the other side. And I'm looking forward to seeing you there. And I appreciate you understanding and bearing with me while I'm trying to preach. Sometimes I give out. I can't help that. Someone asked me to explain. I, I made a statement the other night that my heart is beating 5% of what it should beat. I have a pacemaker, and it's carrying the entire load with the exception of 5%. And uh, that's what I was talking about. They thought, my goodness, are you sure you're even alive? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Sometimes I get so tired I wonder that I give out. I really do, but I appreciate you understanding that. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of St. John, chapter 19. Sister Moose came back tonight. Honey, where are you at? Where, where are you at? She wanted to hear some more good preaching. And she wouldn't go home with Rick, eh? <laughs> she stayed over here. John, chapter 19. Let's stand together, please. Now look up at me. We're going to be dealing with the cross tonight. Many people have a little chain around their neck with a little cross. The cross is all around us, but we've got so used to it. It's just a emblem. It's just a little thing. It's just a religious something. But the cross is far more than any of that. Oh, it's far more. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And what's on that old cross? Jesus suffered and died. Dear one, don't you ever take the cross lightly. John chapter 19. Verse 1, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, 
they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said unto them, Take ye him, and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again into judgment hall and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Our Father, now we pray the blessed power of the Holy Spirit will take our tongue and make our tongue a ready writer's pen. May we say nothing but what the Holy Spirit would give complete endorsement. May we say nothing that would hinder, but magnify and glorify the blessed name of Jesus. Thank you for this week. May eternal things have been done here today. For Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. I don't know whether I'll get to finish this message or not. If you'll bear with me, we'll get as far as we can. Bring yourself now to the time that we're talking about. Here we are at the time when Jesus is before an, an angry, angry mob. In the chapter preceding this one, they have already said, Give us Barabbas, but crucify Jesus. This mob is angry. Jesus Christ, according to them, has breaking some of their most holy and high laws, and by their own estimation said he should be crucified. But now let me stop here, ladies and gentlemen, to insert something that you need to know. The Jews, nor did no one else, kill Jesus. Did you miss what I said? They did not kill Jesus. The Bible said, Jesus said, I lay down my life. I give my life. It is my doing, not yours. Now, I know they performed an act. I know that. I'm fully aware of that. But this was according and completely in accordance with God's blessed will. The Bible said, according to Jesus' coming, that he had his face set like a flint toward this hour. Nothing was going to deter him. Nothing was going to deter For this hour, he had come into the world. He had come for this very purpose. Now you said, oh, those awful people that killed him. The Bible tells me that Jesus commended his love toward us and I tell you, I, I'm honest, my tractor's about to get cranked already. In the while we were sinners, he died for us. And dear one, dear one tonight, I hope that you get a glimpse of the price that was paid. Now get what I'm about to say, not for just an elect, but for the human race. For whosoever will, for fallen humanity, that's who Christ came to die for. Now then, I've got that said. Let me go back to the, to the beginning verses of chapter 19. And I want to pick up a couple of things there that maybe you've never lingered long enough on to see what happened. Here's Pilate now trying to adhere to the demands of the angry mob. And they're saying, crucify him. Pilate, in his mixed up mind, in his confused thinking, commands that Jesus be scourged. Now let me take time enough, if I can, to tell you what's about to happen here. The scourge is whip, sometimes called the cat of nine tails. 
The scourge has a handle sometimes about the size or length of a baseball bat. And on that uh, handle is leather thongs that are fastened to it. And let me step over here, if I may, from the pulpit. And usually it's about as long as from here, maybe a little longer, to the pulpit. And these leather thongs, each one of them, has ever 12 inches or something about that, a piece of metal or bone or some other object tied in to that throng. And there's just many throngs here. The man that's going to do the scourging is a man that this is his job. He knows exactly what he's doing. Jesus Christ, according to historians, Josephus and others has been stripped. He stands here now. The artists have been very kind in their portrayal of Jesus. They did at least give him a loincloth. He said he was there with shame there. And the artist, I think he was nude. And now here is the man. The Bible said in him... In his mouth, no guile had been found. Here is the only sinless man that ever lived. No sin. Not one sin had he ever committed. And now this angry religious mob. Do you know who the worst crowd in the world, if you get them mad, is a bunch of religionists? There ain't nothing they won't do. There's no extreme they won't go to. And here they are. Here stands this innocent man. And Pilate has commanded him to be scourged. Now listen to me. The scourge, when it's thrown out by this man, is like this. And then it wraps around the individual. And just the time that it gets the entire extent of it, he jerks it. And blood and flesh is jerked from that individual. And now the artist, if you've ever saw a picture of Jesus, they have a little crown of thorns and a few little drops of blood. But if you'll notice, the Bible said they smote him with their hands. His face is swollen. His eyes are probably closed. His lips are bleeding. And now then, the scourge wraps around him and jerks. Now listen to me. He could feel pain just like you and I feel pain. He was God and man. He was God-man. Now, if that's a little confusing, I don't mean to be so, but that's exactly what he was. And now the scourge is... I do not know how many licks. I do not know. But many times... We're told that the intestinal tract pours out, pours out. Many men never survived the scourging. They died right there. Sometimes their hands were tied up to a post. Sometimes their arms were around the post and their back stretched tight. And here he was. And the Bible, you know what the Bible said? He opened not his mouth. Ladies and you may not know this, but he was paying a sin debt right there. Right. And you know it was far. How many of you who know who he was dying for? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Jesus was paying a debt that he did not owe. But oh, listen, he was paying a debt that we could not pay. He was doing the stuff. You know, he was standing where you and I deserve to stand. I deserve this. He didn't. But oh, you know what he was doing? He was taking my place. The whipping that he was getting, I deserved. I should have got. But here he stands with his body bleeding profusely. Blood pouring down. I talked to a dear doctor friend of mine and said, if it had not been God, 
he could have never made it to Calvary's Hill because practically all of his blood was gone. Practically all of it was running down around him. And all of the suffering that he was going each time that scourge hit him, the skin and, and, and the flesh and the blood jumped off in the air. Now listen to me. That old song said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left a crimson stain. Now, if you don't want to just kind of wave your hand a little right there, something's wrong. But he washed it white as snow. The songwriter said, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood. Now I'm going to do something here that is just as improper and not even considered good pulpit manner. Oh, but I want to do this. Now will you ladies, I, you say I've been a blessing to you and I've tried, but I do not want anything but female voices in what I'm about to do. I'm going to start you on a song. I don't want you to sit there and start humming, but I want you to open your mouth and sing a verse with me. Will you do it? Just the ladies. Just the ladies. There is a fountain. Sing it. Sing it. Sinner, you have just now heard, you have just now heard the means whereby that you can come to know Christ is plunging beneath that crown filled with blood born from Emmanuel's veins. Don't you sit there tonight and tell me I don't know how. Jesus is saying, run to me. I've paid the debt. It's all paid in full. Everything's been taken care of. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest. Now let's go farther. Let's go farther. Not only has he been whipped, and now to add injury and insult, they put on his head a crown of thorns. These thorns are only found in one place in the world. They'll penetrate leather, even wood, like a nail. And they're pushed down on his head. His hair is filled with his own flesh and blood. Oh, so I, I can well imagine you can look in the gashes on his body and see his rib cage and see his backbone. Here he stands beat and bruised and mauled. His face is like a piece of beefsteak. The Bible said he looked like the bulls of Bashan had gored him into the ground. His body was brief. If you had known him an hour before that, you would not have known him then. You would not have recognized him. Now then, after saying those few things and trying to conserve my own strength and time, let's hurry as they take him to Calvary. Let's go to that hill far away. Let's go to that place where the supreme death is going to be paid. They find he finds himself on Calvary. Now let me, if you will, please 
bring your mind to what's happening. There's three holes in the ground, one here, one here, and one here. Three crosses are going to be placed on an old hill. Two of these crosses are going to be placed for two thieves. The one in the middle. How many of you know who's on the cross in the middle? That's him. This is the end of his earthly travels here as far as paying the debt is concerned. Here's a hole in the ground. Here's a cross. Now, two thieves, two of them, are going to be crucified. I see them as they nail the first one. Spikes are driven in his head. Now, some say the spike was here. Some say here. I do not know. But anyway, spikes are drained, nailed in their hands, in both hands. I'm going to try to help you with something if I can. And then their legs are crossed, but they leave so much slack that about six to eight inches uh, is between them and the cross. That's the reason. They move so little, but they press down on the nails when the pain is so bad. Their lungs are almost paralyzed with pain. The muscle structure in the back is squeezing the very lungs that they breathe with. And here they are. Here's three men now nailed to a cross. Look at them. Three men nailed to a cross. Crosses are raised in the air. There they are. The time is bleak. The time is dark and gloomy. This is not a time of rejoicing for those that know him today. There the crosses are. But I want us to look, if we can, for a moment at the cross on the left-hand side. Here's a thief on that cross. Here's a man that's dying for sins that he has committed. He is receiving his just recompense of reward. They've raised the cross in the air. Suddenly, he presses down on the nails in his legs and raises himself as best he can. And there he hangs in tremendous pain. And his words are coming from his throat. If, if thou be the Son of God, come down and let us come down with you. That's the essence of it. Listen to it. Did you hear what he said? If thou be. If thou. Ladies and gentlemen, as long as that if is in there, you'll never be saved. No. If thou be, my dear one, he is God's son. He is the Lamb of God. He is that blessed, sinless one. And he said to him, If thou be the Son of God, come down and let us come down with you. There are some of you here. I'm going to name this cross if you'll let me. That's the cross of rebellion. Some of you, when you get real sick in the hospital, you suddenly become so religious. God, if you'll let me out of here and get me well again and touch me and heal me, I'll go to church. Oh, isn't it amazing what a little suffering does for you. But when you suddenly get better, you forget those promises. You don't go to church. You know what you are? You're a rebel. You're a rebel. All you want is just the suffering to go away. But my dear friend, listen. Jesus Christ is hanging right there on the, the cross of rebellion. You shuck your fist in the face of God many times. You have said to God, I'll do this and I'll do that. And you haven't done it. There are some of you right now. You take in God's good air every day. You take in his provisions and blessings. Your lungs are operating and your heart's beating. And here you are with a certain amount of health. And you take God's blessings and you still say, if, 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 if. Amen. You're a rebel. You said, you can't call me rebel. I just did. You're a rebel. All you want is God's goodness. But you don't want to live for him and serve him. All you want is to take him, but never give out. How dare you? How dare any of us? To God. How many of you right here right now can raise your hand and say, God's been good to me? What 
have you done for him? The kids run around through the house with rosy cheeks, as healthy as they can be, and you've got bread on the table, and you've got a roof over your head, and you're able to work. You've said, oh, I earn my living. If it wasn't for God giving you the blessings of strength, you couldn't do nothing. So you're a rebel. You won't, but you're never ready to commit and to say, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to give him my best. No, I'll just keep taking in. If thou be the Son of God, if thou be, he's a rebel. He's a rebel. Let's go to the cross on the right-hand side. I'll have to hurry. Here's a man dying for sin, too. He's committed a crime. His punishment is death. Suddenly, he too is about to speak. He said to the other thief over here, he said, this man's done nothing wrong. We're getting what's coming to us. But he's done nothing wrong. Hello? I wonder how he knew that. I believe he went into some church somewhere. I believe somebody told him. I believe they've been following Jesus around. Let's name this cross. How many of you want to know what I call this cross over here? The cross of rebellion. We're going to call this cross the cross of repentance. Honey, you'll have to come there before you ever know that man on the middle cross. Except you repent. That's not my saying. That's out of that blessed black back book up there. Except you repent. Amen. Say that with me. Except you repent. Say it again. Except you repent. You shall all likewise perish. Amen. Some of you look at the word repentance and you say, oh, I know nothing to add. What, what should I repent? You know what's wrong in that old dirty heart. You know what's going on in there. Don't sit there and argue with yourself and me. That old boy said, he, there wasn't no ifs. There wasn't no maybes. He looked over that dirty low down mouth over here and said, hey, he hasn't done anything wrong. We're getting what's coming to us. But wait a minute. He's about to speak again. This time he is not looking at this fellow. This time he's not addressing him. This time... He looks at the middle cross. Now listen to his language. Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe there will be a hand wave right there. Some of you are still kind of ashamed to raise your hand, aren't you? Some of you said, Ooh, I'm just not emotional. Shut up. We're talking about a man dying here for you, and you can't even lift your lazy chicken eating hands up and wave them one time for God. Let's give him away! Someone said, You're crude. Well, crude right back at you. Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The cross of rebellion, the cross of repentance. Look now at the middle cross. What shall we call this cross? The cross of redemption. Jesus has just now heard his last convert's voice. He's about to stir on the cross. That bloody body with eyes swollen to and mouth in awful shape. Blood probably pouring. 
I hear him as he maybe looks toward that cross. I said, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. His last earthly convert. <laughs> There at his death is what I'm talking about. Notice, notice if you will, he's suffering. Suddenly, from that dry, parched mouth filled with blood, he said, Eloi, Eloi, come back to me. And he drops his head and said, It's finished. Some of you say, Well, he was just saying, I'm dying. Oh, no, more, much more than that. He was saying, I came to do a job and I did it. They couldn't stop me. <laughs> hmm. I came for a purpose. I performed it. I fulfilled it. How can we do so little when he did so much for us? How can we think we're being called upon too much when we're expected to come to church twice on Sunday and once on Wednesday? How can we think that's too much? Have you forgot how he was scourged? Have you forgot his bleeding and dying? Have you forgot it? The cross of rebellion. The cross of repentance. The cross of redemption. You said, well, probably wait just a minute. Why didn't he... Why didn't he come down? If he had, you and I would be in hell right now. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he didn't. He paid the full debt. See, we were fallen, the fallen race of Adam. We were sinners. What the law could not do in that it was weak. God, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemning sin in the flesh. Oh, friend, hear me. Human government, all the laws that men have tried had failed, and here was God's answer for man. Amen. Amen. I might as well tell you right here, there'll never be another debt paid. It's already been paid. I don't care, and I'm not trying to be crude. Mr. Mohammed can't do it. Mr. Buddha can't do it. Mr. Confucius can't do it. Amen. Mr. Shinto can't do it. But he did it! While we were yet sinners, going to hell, without any escape from the judgment and the wrath of God, God's Son paid the sin debt for you and I. Now let me tell you what. Over in the temple at this time, the high priest was getting ready for the high day. There was a great big curtain stretched. One time a year, the priest went back behind that curtain. Atonement day, atonement time was made. But you know what? As Jesus Christ suffered and died there, suddenly a great earthquake hit this whole world, and the temple in there, that curtain was taken from the top and ripped all the way to the bottom and said, Let whosoever will come! I don't have to hide how some high potentate to go back there for me. Jesus Christ has already done it. Amen. I feel like I'm going to need somebody to run in just a few minutes. Listen to me, I'm going to hurry. 
and come to a close. I've left a great deal out. Not intentionally, but I'm tired. Listen to me. He's taken down from the cross. He's placed in a borrowed tomb. I had a funny hit me the other day. A lot of people tell me about going to see the tomb where Jesus was laid. Wouldn't it be something if they put a sign outside the tomb saying, slightly used tomb for sale? <laughs> Hardly used at all. But they placed him in a tomb and rolled a stone to the mouth thereof. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Some of you would think that he laid in the tomb, but he did not. He got up and went down into the heart of the earth and gave gifts to men and led captive free. Can you let me imagine? I have the most vivid imagination you could ever imagine. Oh, if you would allow me, and I, we could, let's follow him down to paradise. Suddenly there's a fellow that's just arrived, and he's shouting, praising the Lord. You said, who is he? Why didn't you hear him say there a while ago, this day shall thou be, that thief just got there. An old ex-thief. I see him running up and he'll, hallelujah, he'll be here after a while. He said, oh, it won't be long. I know it. And here is, see, the Old Testament saints are in paradise. I wish I had time to really go off. But the Old Testament saints, and here they are. Here's all these blessed saints. And I see maybe one of them walk over and look down the halls of eternity. And somebody said, I see a light coming. I believe there's somebody coming. And Jesus Christ, God's Son, arrived and set captive free. And oh, let that captive bunch, oh, friend of mine, listen to me, listen to me. And he went back to the prescribed place in the tomb for a given day. Boy, it's hard to preach when you're this drunk. I should say intoxicated. And here he is, and outside the tomb, soldiers are marching. And for three days and nights, they marched up and down in front of that tomb. Don't you hear what I'm saying? I never felt so silly in my life out here in the graveyard guarding a dead Jew. Boy, were they in for a shock. So here they are. Here they are. And all of a sudden, God commands some heavenly, holy angels to the throne room. They come up, bow, salute. He said, angels, I want you to go get my son out of that tomb. He's been down there 33 and a half years. They beat him. They've slaughtered him. I want you to go down there. I see them as they step off of the balconies of eternity, past Jupiter, Pluto, Venus, and Mars, and come swooping down. Whoa! I'd like to be. Swoop down. And the men that guarded that tomb fell as dead men. And suddenly, they rolled the stone away. Not for him to get out, but for you to see in. Somebody said, never saw a preacher act like you're acting. They ain't many of them around. But see, I don't preach in misery. I have a good time while I'm doing it. And I see them as they roll the stone away and maybe step over to the side. And from inside that tomb comes walking not a bruised and battered Savior, not someone with the bloody scars from the hands of man. Out steps that blessed Son of God 
there in the open sunlight with the keys in his hand. And he said, I'm he that was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. And because I live, you can live also. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, I see no reason tonight that you should go to hell. Do you know the reason, Pastor? Is there a reason among you that you should die lost when the price has already been paid? The blood that satisfied the eternal one has already been shed. The Bible said it pleased him to bruise him. It pleased him. So tonight, what are you on? Are you a rebel? Are you a rebel? Is this you here? Are you on this cross? Are you a fault finder? A grumble mouth? A f always discontent? If, 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 is that you? Or are you the one here on the cross of repentance? What tonight will you do with Jesus? He's on your hands. It's not a matter of you just saying, well, no, no. You'll either accept him or reject him tonight. You'll either say yes or no. That's right, Pastor. There's no middle ground here now. Well, you said our religion. If you haven't got a religion that recognizes Christ as the supreme sacrifice, get out of it. Get out of it. I'm asking you while they come to the instruments, please. I'm tired. I've got to give, I'm give out, actually. <coughs> come on, please. I'm asking you tonight, what are you going to do with the crucified one? He died for you. He wants you to accept him and live for him. What are you going to do with Jesus? Mr. Mohammed does not have the answer. Buddha does not have the answer. Jesus said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. He is the answer. Go ahead. Man. Look up here at me. This may be the last message you'll ever hear me preach. I may never be this way again. But I've tried my best to show you Jesus. I don't want you to see me. I want you to see Him. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Please do not look around. Do not look around. I wonder if there's one here right now that'll say, Brother Blue, I'm tired of the life I'm living. I'm tired of going on like I'm going. I see that Jesus is my answer. My only answer. Brother Blue, I need prayer tonight in the behalf of my eternal soul. Would you pray for me? If that is your desire, would you raise your hand right now? Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. And I see that hand. I wonder would you raise your hand and say, Brother Ed, I need prayer so badly. I don't want to die in the shape I'm in. I don't want to go on like I'm going. Raise your hand and say, pray for me. Raise it up. Yes, I see it. Yes, I see it. Another one, please. Another one, please. Father in heaven. I thank you that your son came and died for me, and not only me, but for the sins of the whole world. I pray tonight that anyone that needs to come will meet the pastor here at the front. Come and bow to an old-fashioned altar and make peace with an eternal God. Lord Jesus, thank you for letting me come this way. But may this be a great night, a great time in the hearts of many. For 
Father, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together, please. And while we sing, you raise your hand and you desire prayer and you need to come. I want you to come right now.